In her first book, A Gift from the Stars, Elena Denan gave sketches of 110 extraterrestrial races. These were black and white sketches. And what she has done is that she has produced colorized versions of those sketches with backgrounds and features that allow people to more easily identify and resonate with the beings in her new book, Encyclopedia Galactica. You're listening to Exopolitics Today with Dr. Michael Sala, your source for the uncensored truth regarding the human, extraterrestrial, global, and political agenda. Click the like button and subscribe to this channel. And now, here's Dr. Michael Sala. Well, welcome back, Galena. Great to have you on Exopolitics Today again. Thank you, Michael. Thank you for having me again. Well, I have um, I have my copy of uh, new, your new book, and I I really enjoyed it. Uh, it. It is just full of information for people wanting to learn more about the different extraterrestrial civilizations out there. And so, why don't you tell the story of of how in your first book, A Gift from the Stars, you had these sketches, and and why you felt the need to um, upgrade those and produce them in a in a new book. Well, in my first book, A Gift from the Stars, that I have here, uh, I had made an, a guide uh, of alien races with uh, hand drawings. So this is, this, for instance, a hand drawing. And I had to do this book really quickly uh, in 2020, uh, in four months. So there was an intense, intense work with uh, hand-drawn sketches. And uh, it was very intense because it was a question of safety. I had to go public as fast as possible in order to be protected. But always I, I had a, a kind of a frustration because I was thinking it's a pity because all these images, these holographic images that as I was shown had colors. They were in colors. And um, I would have loved to, to provide a gift from the stars in colors. That would have taken so much time. So I kept that in the, in the back of my mind and um, working very intense, intensively on other books during the, the years that followed 2020, I was thinking I would like to produce a project of colorized guide of alien races just beside my work and it, this book would be more aimed at the star seeds for people to see with what alien culture galactic culture they, they resonate with so that's how encyclopedia galactica started to to uh, to see birth the start of a project um and so that's was the. Um, that's it. <laughs> now I think it's worth pointing out. I mean, you, you are a professional archaeologist and worked as a professional archaeologist in Egypt, uh, restoring uh, ancient Egyptian artworks. So you know, you're you're not just a talented artist, but this was actually part of your profession as an archaeologist. And 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 in, in a way, I mean, that is like the perfect. Uh, background for for what you did with this new book, Michael. It's it's amazing you you you're saying that because I hadn't thought about that, but this is so true. When I used to work in Egypt as an archaeologist, I was Egypt, specialized in Egyptology. I was I am still <laughs> Egyptologist, and I am also engineer in epigraphy. What is epigraphy? It is reproducing by hand drawing. Um, um, ancient artwork, carvings on the walls, wall paintings, statuary, architecture, take measurements and give a pictorial copy, a uh, drawing copy, technical drawing. It was technical drawing uh, I was uh, working in. Um, that if the, the artwork, the original antique is lost or destroyed, that with the artwork, the, 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 the survey, the artwork, the survey, you would be able to do it again. 
produce a, a new copy of the artwork. So that's how precise it needed to be. And in a way, I am doing the same thing, Michael, with um, the galactic um, cultures. I get information, holographic information, and from these, these visuals, I am technically reproducing um, what I see, uh, documenting these, uh, these beings, and uh, it's in a way uh, the same work. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. To me, I, I see it as almost like a, a kind of like just a graduation or promotion from doing uh, archaeology of uh, an ancient Earth civilization to now doing a kind of like an archaeological or encyclopedic survey of the galaxy. Yes, this is a survey of the galaxy. It is actually that's what it is because. The, the artworks are, are nice, I suppose, but they are also uh, technically um, accurate. Well, I would say accurate maybe 95% because it's always a challenge, you know, to get as close as possible to the, the image you see. In Egypt, I had first hands, physical hands on the, on the, the objects, on the, on the artifacts. Uh, so I was able to take measurements and uh, triangulations. But with holographic images, you cannot. So it's just up to you to record with your brain, with your capacity of recording. And I am really, uh, that's my professional uh, skills. Uh, that's what I do. I'm able to visually record and produce a kind of a accurate 100% copy if possible. You know, it's always swinging before 95 to 100%. I have to be honest because it's sometimes it's difficult. <laughs> well, in A Gift from the Stars, I mean, you had 110 extraterrestrial races that you illustrated with your drawings, your black and white drawings. And I, as I recall, they were races that were in some way connected with um, humanity or Earth. Uh, but in the uh, the Encyclopedia Galactica, uh, you you have a much more wider scope. I mean, in this this book you have 150 races. I um, mean, this book, but it only goes to you know from uh, from A to C. You're only going from like a, and I think it was Andromeda to Canis Major. So you're only doing. Uh, the letters A to C and all the races. So how many races eventually do you think you're going to be covering in in the, your Encyclopedia Galactica series? I think about a thousand, uh, maybe more. Um, I am getting information as I go. I am going to um, plug, I mean, um, a tune, interface, well, that's the, the word, interface with the database of the, the, the Excelsior ship. And I am going to get um, one culture and I'm going to work on it. So I know as I go, you know, I don't have the bigger picture yet, but I am, um, I have the clearance to have access to only the stage three civilizations. Because the stage, stage three civilizations regarding the prime directive are interstellar civilization cultures who have by themselves developed the ability to travel out of their solar system. That's stage three. If I had to document the whole life in the galaxy, it's, it's impossible. It would be a whole library I would have to create, you know. There is so much. So it's only the interstellar culture, spacefaring cultures. Okay, well, that's that's a, a good place to start. I mean, because uh, humanity is uh, an interstellar spacefaring culture, even though uh, most of us, maybe ninety nine point nine percent, have nothing to do with it. But the one percent or point one percent that are involved in the secret space programs, I mean, they are an interstellar um, civilization or representation of uh, of our planet. So. Yeah, eventually we're going to meet with these space-bearing cultures. So great to have a, a, a kind of like Encyclopedia Galactica. Yes, and um, the way I um, had this information, there, there's a little bit of a, a braid. When I wrote a gift from the stars, um, 
Thorhan Eredion, my contact in the Galactic Federation of Worlds, was transmitting to me via my implant, my device, communication device, holographic images, and then he would tell me um, what they are, who they are, where they live. My implant had been has been upgraded in 2022 because uh, I was starting to really get attacked and people were trying to hijack my 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 contacts. So my implant was uh, upgraded to a military grade of the Federation, a higher grade and more encoded. And because I have now this more encoded uh, frequency, I am allowed to, uh, it, it allows me, I mean, to access some data. The frequency is right, the, the, the carrier wave is right. So I, this time, Thorhan is not doing anything. I got the clearance to plug into this database whenever I want. And so I would get, I would say in my, in my, um, my head, next, I place the intention next, and I would have holographic images and it's, it works by the download of information, so I would hear the name. So the names of the, the races are phonetic, phonetics, phonetical, uh, is how I heard them. Of course, it's not exactly how the ETs themselves would pronounce their name, but it's phonetically the most approaching. And then I have all this data that I need to, to type in English, and... Um, and it's not over because I need to locate the, the star system. So I would have coordinates and um, just coordinates. And so I, after this, with these coordinates that I write down the numbers, I would go on the NASA website and I would look for what star is there, what are what is there. And that's how I found all the stars. So it was long, long work. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and that is fascinating. So this database that you're able to connect with through your upgraded implant, I mean, that has, like like we were saying, I mean, that has um, a catalogue of the most significant space-faring civilizations in our soul, in our galaxy, yes. and, and that you're able to reproduce that and, and that it's almost like a, a kind of like a galactic internet or, I mean, if people talk about the Akashic record and tuning into the sun, like Edgar Casey tuned into the sun to get the Akashic record to give people information on, you know, their, their history and illnesses and so forth. You can do something similar, tuning into some kind of galactic Akashic record or internet where you learn all about the history of different extraterrestrial civilizations. Is it something along those lines? Yeah, something along those lines. So I would have images. And that's up to me to try to transcribe them uh, artistically the, the most accurately as possible. But I would hear this um, voice that would interface with my 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 mind. It's like it's it's like a masculine synthetic voice that uh, it's like it's a computer voice that is um, uh, it's in English. Well, it's uh, interface in English for me. They all Thorhan all in um, set up everything for me. And I would hear that and I would type very, very, very quickly all the informations. And then I would really look over the, the, the notes with the typos and reform the phrases, sentences. But that, that's how it works. Okay. Well, you sent me uh, some of the images of the different extraterrestrial races that you described. So I thought maybe we could go through a few of these and just get a better idea of who... Uh, you're, you're describing a little bit about their history and significance. So the first one I want to begin with is this um, Andromedan or Xenate. Uh, so you want to tell us about the origins of the Andromedans and, Z and, and what they have to do, what that has to do with the, I think, the planet Xenate? Uh, so <clears throat> it's in the, the constellation Andromeda and uh, Alex Collier is in contact with these beings. And uh, we've never really managed to get an image, uh, accurate image of them. So that's the image I was given, the, the profile I was given. Um, they are in, um, it's Epsilon uh, Andromeda, the star system, and they call their planet Titawin. 
they are highly spiritual beings. It's a very, very advanced culture, and they are at the origin of the Zenatean Alliance or the Andromedan Council, how we know it best. And they are the head of this council, this alliance that gathers the most spiritually evolved cultures of this galaxy. So they are very important people, the Zenate, and um, most important uh, of about them it's that uh, they warned the galaxy that on earth was the, the the seed of a potential evil that would set a, a tyranny a galactic tyranny so um and we had this information from uh, alex collier the Andromedan contactee, uh, a very long time ago already, and you know, he he was uh, disclosing this. So it was my pleasure to get to see a holographic image of one of them. And I was like, wow, that's how they look like, because I never met uh, any of them physically. So it was very interesting. So Zenate is the name for the Andromeda constellation as as I understand it, and not a planet. And so this Zenate represents this alliance of civilizations, I think 140, that are part of the council. So the Andromeda Council, Zenate Council, I mean, we're talking the same thing. Yes, the Zenate Council is because it's the Zenate. Zenate is the name of their race, their, their race. They are humans. Oh, yes, Zenate is the name of their race. They are, they are a race of humans, human species. I see. So those 140 space-faring cultures that are part of the this Andromeda okay. Council, uh, mm -hmm. many of those are connected to the Zenate race? No, 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 no. The Ohorai Arcturians are part of it, for instance. Uh, you have different, different cultures. Um, I wouldn't name all. 140 of them, but um, not all are humans. No, not all are linked to them uh, bi biologically. Biologically. All right. So uh, you you describe them as a having a kind of spiritual military culture that they're really a kind of like a Jedi as represented in in the Star Wars series. So so you know, can you maybe just explain? And I think you did talk about the temporal war. So, so maybe explain how the way they operate as a spiritual military culture in bringing about balance in our galaxy. So they are um, using uh, spiritual principles such as cosmic laws, universal laws of evolution and respect of all life to act, to produce actions. And their actions would be their very organized military type uh, uh, way of doing things although they they will always act regarding bringing back the balance of things and bringing back higher frequencies re-equilibrating the frequencies of a place for instance that had been um, lower down or attacked or that had planet or world that had uh, endured an aggress aggressive invasion. So they are here to help uh, rebalancing the energies. And they work also on the consciousness. They are very wise people. And I'm not an expert on the matter. I just uh, know what I get from the database. The, the, the person to really ask is Alex Collier. Mm -hmm. Um, now, I, I know that there have been um, 22 genetic experiments on Earth uh, and that these genetic experiments, uh, experiments can be traced to the 24 cedar races and each of those cedar races work with different uh, ET civilizations from within our galaxy. So in establishing colonies on Earth, w w was there ever an Andromedan uh, or Zenate colony? Yes, there was. There, apparently there was. And they are, I think they even have an arc or two, maybe. I do not know. At least there's an arc there. I do not know where it is. Okay. So uh, for those that maybe 
don't know uh, when arcs are used for the seeding of a civilization on a world like, like ours those those arcs after they've done the seeding they get buried they get hidden but they lay dormant in case they're ever needed for uh you know what exactly do you want to just elaborate on that so the galactic federation of worlds or i would say the galactic alliance that includes the galactic federation of worlds and the zenate uh, council and other organizations they have a policy of helping worlds each in their own ways but it will always involve um, providing evacuation vessels or arcs when a planet enters membership with the alliance with any organization within the alliance they will be provided um, kind of an armada of arcs so the arcs will be either buried on their planet or either hidden in their star system it depends um, on how easy it is safe to leave arcs on the planet if the planet has a um, unstable political situation they will not for instance they will not want that the arcs and this technology would be used for bad uh, bad aims um, so the arcs are first vessels um, just to in case of uh, an evacuation is needed but not only uh, these arcs also they are called arcs because they contain data and technology inside so these arcs at one point will will either help evacuate a world in danger or either be there to provide technology and provide uh, knowledge about um more advanced civilizations and it would help the, the, the population on the planet to to move forward in their evolution when they're ready by offering them this technology so the arcs have two purpose in fact yes and you have mentioned in one of the earlier interviews that these arcs the crews you said that uh, they were approximately a dozen a dozen crew so the and they of course would be Andromedan star seeds or Zenate star seeds, and um, in addition there might be Zenate star seeds that are here uh, because they were dropped off or involved or somehow get trapped on Earth. So is that pretty much the way it works? Yes, yes. Always the crews would follow the cycles of, in of incarnation on the planet, always being standing ready. Uh, if something happens, um, yeah. Okay. Well, another civilization you describe in the in um, uh, Encyclopedia Galactica is the Tengri Tengri from Trappist One. So, yeah, I mean, tell us about those. That they, that, that looks like a very interesting species. The Tengri Tengri, I love them. They are very interesting. Um, the, um, it's a Tengri that he, who is herald at the High Council of the Galactic Federation of Worlds at the moment. It turns, so it's very interesting because uh, was that plan with the Earth Alliance? I do not know. But in March, on March 11, 2021, I received a message from Thorhan Eredion, my contact, and he said, James Webb Telescope will bring either attention or either furthermore evidence of life in the Tengri Tengri star system. I went, oh, oh wow, okay. So I wrote an article and uh, on my website, okay, the James Webb Telescope may point out in, in July, next July to, uh, to this system. And it did. <laughs> When when uh, NASA broadcast, it was in July. The the the, the live, where everyone was like, oh, you know, uh, the Trappist One star system. Oh my goodness! So that was not a surprise for me, but it was quite awesome. So who are the Tangri Tangri? Um, they are a race on their own. They are cousins with a race named as well the Coldest Sea. The Coldassi are um, a very ancient people who are linked with the builders, the builder race, the mysterious builder race. 
and the cold dust, you have two outposts uh, in our solar system, it's Venus and um, uh, Neptune. Anyways, the Tengri Tengri are a very ancient civilization. They live on the second planet of Trappist One. They live um, mostly underground because the conditions of their planet has changed and uh, with time and uh, is not um, as habitable as it was before. But they live half on the surface in domed cities and half on the ground. They are a spacefaring nation and uh, they have been in contact with Earth uh, for a long time. They are a fascinating race. Um, I, I noticed those kind of tentacles almost. So I'm wondering in w w whether they have evolved from some octopi uh, species, like uh, because you know, that, that would be interesting to know in terms of evolution, how they evolved as a as an intelligent uh, civilization and developed technology and so forth did they did their earliest uh, origins come from say an octopi race like a marine race or was it some other origin there's something amphibian with them um I, I would say yes, because the on, in the Coldasii, who are the most the original version of them, the the Coldasii are more really look like more like octopus like. They are humanoids, as the Tengri, but you can really see it's not hair; it's appendix like tentacles, and it's moving. It's moving. It's not like hair. It's it's animated. Each strand has its own life its own movement you know that's very um very interesting um as they think and they speak the tentacles would move accordingly if they are have a, a strong emotion the tentacles start to move quickly quicker and with more amplitude you know if they are very calm it falls straight it's uh it's fascinating. There's a lot of octopi uh, races I've noticed on different levels of evolution and different branches. You have even gigantic octopi-like etheric beings, notably the O in the, the, the cedar races. They, are, they live in space. They do not have physical body. They are just uh, supra-consciousness, but they have this shape like floating octo octopi. Um, it's uh, apparently quite widespread um, uh, genetics. It's very interesting, fascinating, I would say. Yeah, I, I think it is fascinating how uh, you, you get uh, these amphibians evolving and uh, the octopi could be a source for these amphibians like uh, the Tengri Tengri. So with this particular one, uh, do they just have four tentacles or there's uh, more in the back? It's, no, it's about six. There are two more in the back. I see. Okay. Well, uh, I, th I think the octopi, are, is it eight? They have eight tentacles, uh, but but I, I, I couldn't see why maybe as they evolve, they develop six or they lose two for whatever reason, or maybe maybe two form into arms. Maybe that would be the way it happens. The Koldasi, the original race from where the, the Tangri have evolved, have um, more than six tentacles they have way more it's like when you look at them it looks like um, big dreadlocks <laughs> these tentacles and uh, they have plenty maybe eight maybe more i don't know but it's more than six anyway okay okay and i think it's worth just kind of emphasizing that that you said that on the trappist one system that they, there would be a, a number of planets that were that exist that are habitable and that uh, this is where life has evolved. And and the James Webb Space Telescope focused on the TRAPPIST-1 system first. And I think they they confirmed uh, how many planets were there. Uh, or maybe that was done through some of the other telescopes like the Kepler, the, how many planets were in the TRAPPIST system. So do you remember that? Oh, I don't remember exactly. I think there are seven habitable planets in the TRAPPIST-1 star system. But that's only the habitable ones. I think they're something like 10 or 12, uh, plus the moons. Because when we speak about planets, uh, sometimes uh, you 
you have planetoids, you have moons. Sometimes some planets are not habitable, but their moons are. Oh, it's more, you know, sometimes. Number is more. Yeah. Well, another race, uh, the, the Shungat, and uh, you describe them as being uh, the main galactic producers of red crystals that power ships. So, yeah, you, you want to tell us about the Shungat? The Shungat, they come from the, uh, the, the Apus constellation. Um, the star, well, I, I, I need to look in, my, um, in the book to tell you exactly what star it is. Um, here we go, the Shungat. The star is Toy 913. That's the that's how it's repertoried. So they are producers of this uh, red crystal. Their planet is um, eighty percent uh, composed of this crystal. It's uh, really akin to mercury dioxide, and this is used. They call it core and this is used uh, a lot in the core engine of the ships to power core engines it it can store an enormous amount of energy and give it back so you would assimilate them to the dilithium crystals in star trek it's exactly the same uh, use and this uh, this core this 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 crystal mine it is found every uh, some in some places sorry in the galaxy but i have to say on their world it's really huge the world is made of this nearly um, the core at natural state is 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 not doing any anything it's when traversed by pulse waves or pump wave or gravity waves uh, that it starts to ignite and produce energy, release energy. It's very interesting material. It's red, like ruby red. So the Galactic Federation of Worlds straight away uh, passed contract with the Shungat to uh, buy and do a trade with them. And so their planet, because they accepted, their planet is surrounded by a shield and uh, stations from the federation who uh, gather the, the crystals they mine for them and they, they buy them so the shungat ha, are very rich they are very very prosperous culture they are reptilians so you know that's interesting that um, we picked this one because it shows also that not all reptilian beings are um nefarious you know the sikar are are horrible uh, people but not all reptilians are you know are nasty as nasty as them these ones are lovely people they love arts music beauty they adorn their skin with colors flowers they love arts and music as i said but you do not mess with them because they are very territorial they are very territorial. You, you are welcome to their planet, but don't touch anything. It's theirs, you know. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, yeah, I think that's so important that we distinguish between uh, the friendly uh, reptilians and the uh, imperial reptilians, like the Draco reptilians and, and those that are allied with them. And I, I just wanted to get your uh, comment about... Um, earth-based reptilians that are also friendly because we know ancient history uh you you have like in the um mahabharata uh, the indian classic they describe the nagas as this kind of like a uh, serpent-like reptilian race that actually helped uh one of the sides or the winning side in in the war and they would as i recall they were uh, uh, described as wisdom keepers and powerful warriors so yeah, um, yeah, how how important are these friendly reptilians in terms of uh, Earth history, and, and are they still here in underground cities? The Nagas are related to the Tiru on Mars. The Nagas are the are more ancient than humans on Earth. They were there before everyone. They found Earth before everyone. But the problem is at the time, you know, every culture evolves. 
at the time they wanted to get earth for themselves and they so they terraformed it and they developed any reptilian life that was latent on, on earth they really developed it and <coughs> they, they terraformed it suppressing chances for other life form to naturally develop that's how how you had dinosaurs and the, the, all the giant uh, reptiles well earth became a reptilian planet uh the cedars arrived around 65 uh, million years ago and they said oh, you don't you don't do that uh, we are going to chase you and fight you and uh retire from earth to bring earth back at the start uh to give all life form a chance to develop we're going to reset it so uh really bad events happened and there was war the nagas went underground many of them were destroyed there was a uh, really a uh, a shower of uh, meteorite or asteroids that really uh, destroyed a lot and and then earth was reterraformed to give a chance to everyone every life form the nagas who survived uh went underground and that's where they elected uh residents for all this time they developed into with time into a peaceful culture because they they always said earth is ours we own it we were there before everyone so there's a bit of confusion with that but that's why they think they're in on their planet they think that they live on the ground but they've learned how to live with other cultures of inner earth because they live at the near to the surface between the surface and inner earth it, yeah, it's a bit the transition um, layer um, and they've developed into becoming wise you know and helping cultures it's true they live more under the asian areas asian continent the problem is a faction of them was um compromised and um you know corrupted by the sikar when the sikar which were the alpha draconian uh, reptiles uh, and invaded earth again they tried to come many times but when they invaded earth a, a few uh, thousand years ago they they found the nagas and they say hey you're also reptilians you should ally with us most of them say no 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 we have a, don't want any problems but some of them were corrupted and joined the sikar in the the their agenda of you know um owning earth that mm -hmm. that's why it's sometimes confusing about the nagas okay mm -hmm. now i want to talk about one of these other races are uh, the ula meratan and in in the in the encyclopedia galactica you describe them as uh, I guess inventors or distillers of the famous blue ale, which I guess is is equivalent to like the beer of the galaxy. Like it's traded and dra and and uh, drank everywhere. Oh yes, the Ula Meratan. They're from the Aquila constellation, and uh, they are humanoids. They have uh, sometimes you hear about uh, the dog people. They're not dogs. They are humans, and they have this elongated uh, face like a muzzle. And it's very real and weird and they have some ridges on the on the, the skin on the skull sorry like this um they are uh, very fascinating to observe and the ulla meratan they invented the fam famous ulat the blue drink the bubbly blue drinks that myself and jean charles moyen have described to you and jp as well and many others have described some um secret space program soldiers have also described this blue ale and so these are the people the ula meratan in the aquila constellation who created it they are extremely rich as i can you can imagine their uh, recipe is being uh, produced by now many other cultures but they own the rights so every time as uh, this this blue ale is being produced they have a percentage in, on, on the sales uh, of course there is uh, illegal blue ale <laughs> of course you know um 
there's a lot of things happening in this galaxy, you know. You have the Galactic Guild of Merchants. You, there's a lot of things I, I'm, I'm covering in this book. <laughs> Yeah, I, as, I, as I recall, I think there was a kind of forbidden blue ale in the Star Trek uh, series where, where one of the races uh, specialised or used this blue ale and it was banned in the Federation. So, um, so yeah, is, is that a kind of alluding to this kind of bootlegged blue ale? In Star Trek, it may refer to the Romulan blue ale. Correct. But... Uh, you know, not sure, but it, Star Trek is such a disclosure, you know. Now, you sent me another race, which I thought is very interesting. Uh, this is the Kelt 7 star system, and you describe them as having a leisure and commerce hub similar to, to the one that's being built near Jupiter. So, yeah, you want to tell us about uh, this race and the hub that they've built? Yes, so the rays we see on screen, they are the VIN, and the VIN um, live in the Kelt 7 star system in the Aurega constellation. They are tr not traders, but very into commerce, and they have created what is called Vatukat. Vatukat is a leisure center, galactic leisure center. It is based on their planet but also they have several hubs in orbit of their planet. And when I was, um, I, I, I got information before the, I learned that the hub in orbit of Jupiter would be built. And then when the, the hub uh, developed, and the, the Jupiter hub developed, and I was explained the different purpose, I, oh, that sounds familiar. And then Vatukat, of course. Kelt 7, uh, the VIN, they, so it's interesting to, to, to learn how this hub may develop, I say not maybe will, but may develop, there's a lot of chance it will develop like this, uh, it's a commercial hub, and this Vatukat also, so the planet and the, the, the hubs in orbit of the planet. Uh, you have uh, different cultures that have elected uh, residents on these hubs and on the planet, and everyone is running their own specialties. And the VIN are uh, specialized in, um, how to say, pleasure, <laughs> leisure, <laughs> and especially um, holographic um reconstitu reconstruction of reality so you would see the equivalent of the on, on star trek with the holodex you know the vino specialist of that other cultures are producing uh, holographic entertainment and uh, leisure uh, reconstruction um, parallel realities but uh the vino are quite known for that so uh, i think on the hub near jupiter we will certainly, certainly have a section for leisure and you will certainly have, you will certainly encounter these people you see there on screen, the VIN, uh, they are, um, how to say, registered by the Galactic Guild of Merchants uh, officially to uh, offer, provide this uh, commerce. So they're, they're kind of like uh, the Ferengi in, in Star Trek who, who really were all about commerce and uh, in Deep Space Nine they, they set up a pleasure centre there for people that just wanted to you know, go in and have these holographic uh, highs. So, yeah, so the, the, the Ven are kind of like the Ferengi. Yes, in, 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 uh, in, in some sort, yes. I, have, I haven't seen the information with what was what, given to me that they are very greedy with money a profit like the ferengi but there's so many similarities okay fascinating well uh, one of the other races uh, probably one that's uh, most widely known on earth are uh, the anunnaki or the anak empire and and you described how they arrived in our galaxy in the Boots constellation about 700,000 years ago and 
when they arrived, uh, presumably from another galaxy, uh, they were led by Anu, who is still their king. So you want to tell us about uh, the Anunnaki history and, and you know, their importance? Yes, so uh, I'm, I'm happy that in, in the same book I could cover uh, the complete Anunnaki history from Bhutas, because Bhutas is in it, and Canis Minor, where the seat of the empire is now. The Anunnaki come from a parallel universe. The you are and it's called U Uraeya uh, Galaxy. I don't know if I pronounce it correctly. Nobody will <laughs> blame me for that. Uh, they arrived through the Bhutas vortex. There is a, a big vortex, like a big wormhole, uh, near the Arcturus star. So that's why Arcturus is a uh, quite a star that we we speak a lot about because as this this type of vortex near it. They came there and it was Anu who was at the time one of the royal princes. He came here with his court and he set his own empire. He was expanding the empire of, of his mother, the great empress, uh, who reigned about, I think at the time it was seven galaxies. Uh, her name is A Kim Lu. And he set an outpost of the empire in Nataru galaxy. It was first located in the Bhutas constellation around the star Arctur Arcturus and another next to it. Anu uh, crowned himself emperor of the Anach um, outpost in Nataru. He took for spouse Namu, who was a human Anunnaki. Uh, I describe how the Anunnaki are not one race, they are a compound of race, like the Galactic Federation of Worlds, but with not that much, you know. They are a collective from their own universe. The, the particularity, common particularity that they have, which is very interesting, is elongated skull, which varies regarding the, the species. You have humans, grey-based and reptilian-based. Uh, races. It's very interesting. Anu was human with a little bit of gray, was kind of a hybrid, <clears throat> but mostly human. Very, very long, uh, elongated skill. He married um, Namu, was a human Anunnaki. They had, a f uh, she was pregnant with Enki or Ia when they left uh, the, the, the Bhutas constellation to go to Sirius B because um, Anu had made an agreement to marry a Sikar queen of an offshoot of the draconian uh, Sikar empire in Orion. So Anu was a young emperor. He was very greedy for territories at the time and anything to expand his young empire. Uh, of course, his wife wasn't happy with that. Nobody was happy with that. There was kind of a split. And him, he took Namu, his wife, and their son, Enki or Ia, to the Series B star system. And there, he, and Anu married uh, Tia, the Sikar reptilian queen. And they had a son and was known like as Enlil, Yu Enlil, by the, afterwards. And the deal was the Sikar queen was giving Anu a tremendous lot of territories in the Orion constellation and the Sirius B star system was part of it in exchange of what their son should later on reign on the empire and that's the whole story how it began so I describe everything in the book it truly is fascinating so yes. that means that um, 700,000 years ago when uh, this Anunnaki uh, colony arrived in the Boots uh, star system, th that it was led by Anu, the crown prince, and uh, he established an Anak empire using Boots as the location. And, and he's still alive. I mean, so 700,000 years. I mean, how many times? Uh, I, I know there's a cloning process. So can you maybe describe with someone like Anu, who is 700,000 years old, how many times has his body been cloned during that period? I think an, 
I, we cannot count it's an accountable uh, amount of uh, of cloning number of cloning <coughs> sorry the Dianunaki uh, they like to transfer the consciousness from clone to clone not to lose their memory to keep on building their knowledge and wisdom they're going to transfer their consciousness from clone body to clone body but after a while as i was explained the, the clones they, they lose something they become a bit corrupted the, the, the skin don't hold well you know so they're gonna start to stop doing this when when they see that the cloning is not working very much anymore they are going to stop there in their last body and they are going to undergo the cycle of incarnation and be born again in a new body a new incarnation to avoid this uh, they can become abra or immortal but this is a very very uh, challenging uh, process because it's painful it's long and it involves a uh, total uh, transformation of consciousness uh, uh, transmutation of the soul and this this is what ia went went through and once you succeed because you may not once you succeed you become um you become an immortal that means the body you're in will never corrupt but you will have reached a state of consciousness where all your powers will be activated but more you can tap into the powers of the universe and use them for for yourself so the abraha goes with wisdom you cannot become an abraha if you have um bad agendas you know uh, like conquest agenda or you know service to self agenda because it's a question of frequency you will not be able so you need to become very very wise and and uh, that, that's how it works so, so has Anu gone through this Abraha process? I mean, Enki has. Uh, did Anu do it beforehand? Yes, Anu did it, and his wife as well. Yes, okay. that's why Anu changed uh, policy after he did it. It was during the Orion Wars, as I was told. He he changed. He wasn't um, angry for hungry for territories anymore, and he was first. Uh, thinking about his people about his subjects the subject of his empire to protect them that's why he didn't get involved in the in the orion wars and that has been um uh something people reproached them to him you know uh why didn't you help the, the orion population you were there at series b and you just cowardly backed up in fact his excuse was he was protecting his empire because he was feeling he was not um they were not uh, strong enough against the nebu at the time i see now you you mentioned that his mother uh originally sent him and that original anak colony to our galaxy the nataru galaxy so is his mother still uh the empress in this parallel universe of of five galaxies i do not know i don't have this information i don't know something to ask yeah. yes that's a fascinating question well now we can uh, move to the uh, altair star system and you talked about some secret space program earth colonies and the dark fleet so you want to tell us about that yes the altair star system otherwise known as alcorin <clears throat> um is a very interesting uh, compound of different cultures and and agendas and organizations and you have their human colonies from earth which is interesting the altair star system uh you have the ahori the ahori are uh humanoids blonde humanoids very pale skin who have been working with the alcyon tal shiar uh collaborating with the dark fleet collaborating with the nazis fourth reich at the time in antarctica and also the the, the deep state the dark governments the, the altair and ahoria were very involved uh, they were they can be considered as nordics 
That's why I always say, be careful when you speak about Nordics. It encompasses so many different races, cultures with different agendas. You, you never know who you're talking about. Well, the Ahori are Nordics, but we more paler skin and pale, paler hair. They have a collective there. They, so there's them on, uh, on the second planet, uh, Ahorat, are cousins of them. And uh, the Dakoru, Dakori, are uh, positive beings. They don't work with the Ahori. They never wanted to be involved with uh, the, the Dark Fleet and etc. or the Tal Shiar, so that's them. And you have Marhat. So Marhat, Marhat is a planet in the same star system where you have a collective. And there, this is very interesting. Um, at the time I wrote this book, there were still uh, the Nebu involved, uh, which they are not now in the Marhat collectives. So you had the Nebu, the Kili Tokert, the Sikar, and the Nebu have withdrawn because they were dismantled and dead. Uh, the Sikar have withdrawn, they cut ties with them, the Kili Tokyo withdrawn, but who stays remains in this Markat collective. It's very interesting. Um, you have, of course, the Ahori, but you have also the Dark Fleet, a colony, an outpost of the Dark Fleet, which headquarters are based in Aldebaran. This uh, Dark Fleet colony, they are human, from Earth. The Dark Fleet is, was created on Earth. And um, so they still have this outpost there on this planet. And also you have, which is very interesting, a human colony from, um, I was said, a secret, told, a secret space program uh, from the US Air Force. And it's humans there, it's super soldiers, they have an outpost there, but it's not a positive uh, space program, not working for the, the, the greater good of humanity. They are allied with the Dark Fleet, the, the, the Ahori, the Talshar. Um, they are um, dealing uh, slaves, slave trade, humans from Earth are sent there. And I think it's a um, relic from... Uh, when the secret space programs in our solar system were taking abductees from Earth and bringing them to the moon to be dis dispatched to other locations. One of these locations was Mars, for instance, but other locations were colonies throughout the galaxy where these people will be trained as um, uh, slave force, workforce, uh, sex trade as well, or you know, sometimes food for other cultures. And these people, this colony on, on Marhat, this secret space program uh, outpost, uh, have been dealing humans from Earth and also asserting an outpost there. Uh, now the situation is changing. They are in the midst of uh, withdrawing and being sent back to Earth because of the war uh, against the Sikar Empire that is raging through the galaxy at the moment, the ancient allies of the Sikar are breaking ties with them, with the Sikar. Uh, and so this human colony is in the process of losing allies and backup, and they start to feel uncomfortable there in the LTA star system, and they are, re they are being recalled to Earth because, you know, it's not safe for them anymore there. Okay, so all of these um, uh, secret space program individuals that say that they served on these dark fleet colonies in different star systems, there, there is a factual basis to that uh, because it sounds really wild that people uh, have been serving for 20 years on a dark fleet base in another uh, solar system. I mean, we know Tony Rodriguez has, has described uh, his service for 13 years as part of the Dark Fleet, a merchant ship that he was a part of, but that was based on Ceres. Uh, but uh, what you've learned is that there, there are these Dark Fleet colonies in Altair and elsewhere uh, that have existed and have been involved in the uh, slave trade 
taking people off Earth, I guess, to replenish their genetic stock on these star systems. So, so that's very interesting. That's something I definitely plan to um, look explore more in future. Yes, fascinating, fascinating. In uh, your February 25 webinar, and, and for those listening, we do not know why uh, there is this really strange sound that uh, is coming up in uh, these interviews. Um, my uh, video uh, editor can't figure it out. I can't figure it out. We know it's not the guests, uh, but it seems to be some kind of intervention. You hear a strange sound almost like a, a ghost-like sound. We don't know what that is. Uh, maybe it's some kind of intervention. But uh, <laughs> unless you have any clue, Elena, did you hear it? Have you been hearing these kind of ghost-like sounds coming? Yes, I have been. It looks like uh, they are willing, uh, uh, will to make contact. I know this happens regularly when I'm in the, in a video because of my uh, implant is making static electromagnetic interferences, and sometimes you can hear a Thorhan's voice through. And uh, recently, it's, it's happening more and more, and uh, it's even happening in your videos, Michael. I've noticed that in your Saturday uh, week in review, uh, it happened, and uh, it's start to go through. It's like they they're playing jokes at trying to um, communicate, manifest themselves. It's uh, sometimes you can hear uh, people talking with words behind. Uh, it's kind of fun. Okay, all right. Well, that's that's good. That's very reassuring. So for those watching this, this is not our attempt to kind of like use subliminal programming to get you to, you know, uh, buy books or something. Or you know, This is uh, some kind of electronic uh, communication coming from the ETs themselves. Yes, yes, I, uh, I'm pretty sure it's that. Yeah, it's but, this. But yes. definitely buy Elena's book, <laughs> uh, paperback and hardback versions. I, I got the paperback versions. Uh, but for a few dollars more, you can get the hardback version and the quality is is definitely worth it. Um, so let's uh, move on to uh, your uh, last webinar where you discussed going onto the Nibiru mothership and you uh, uh, were spent time in an ancient library. So do you want to just give people a recap? Uh, uh, not that one, Jazz, the, the other, the, oh yeah, no, that is right. No, that, no, that's the wrong one. Uh, bring up the, February 25 webinar. So yeah, Jazz will bring that up for us. But uh, yeah, the yeah, just tell us about the uh, Nibiru mothership and the ancient library there. Yes, I thought I would make a, a, a webinar on all the the libraries I, I had the opportunity, the chance to visit on the Nibiru, the Nibiru ship, who is where Ia lives at the moment, in orbit of Jupiter. Uh, every time I go there, I, um, I'm shown something different and uh, not everything at, at once because I need to process it. And uh, Ia is very, very, uh, very nice, very kind in, in this that uh, is showing me things slowly, slowly. Uh, I have accessed libraries and hubs of knowledge on that ship, which is beyond, beyond what you can imagine it's amazing so you have a library complex on that ship which uh, contains different sections the biggest section is called the abakir and the abakir com uh, comprises um, artifact museum section that is my favorite one uh, then you have uh, different sections with different ways of storing information there is one where uh, you have conical metallic uh, books uh, they are uh, they are that that size uh, and it looks like aluminium or steel and you press uh, you put your finger on a symbol and it downloads information in you into you it's it's uh, like books, in fact. You have um, pads where you can uh, step on and it interface with your DNA and you put your intention on a memory in time and you are going to see a, a holographic screen coming from the, the, the hexagonal pad and unfolding in front of you and you will be in the movie. 
uh, of the memory you uh, want to, to see. It's reading your own um, records, your own Akashic record in a way. I really read in brackets. And so there's this, there's also the, the, the most impressive thing was uh, what they called Mad Kahal. Mad means a vortex or singularity, the singularity of a vortex, more precisely, mad. Um, because they have another word in Anak, which is Bab, which is the, the stargate or the door. So the Mad Kahal is the vortex singularity to the Kahal. And the Kahal is the Akashic records of the universe. So it it's, it's it's a room with a lot of different it's not holograms it's it's strange it's luminous symbols it looks like holograms luminous symbols and lines and data in a strange alphabets that is coming from a vortex in the middle of it like a black hole but it's a white hole in fact expanding that data and it's jumping out twirling in all direction, associating with other symbols and disappearing. And it's doing that constantly. It goes extremely fast, extremely fast. Um, it made me think to a giant brain where you have all the electrical impulsions between the, the neurons. But it's more than that. It's beautiful. It's really beautiful. So the way you, you interface is to you just enter into it. And you are going to interface your mind, you ask a question. And in fact, when you tune into the question, you create a quantum entanglement to the answer that comes from the middle of the vortex. To access this information, if you're very careful, you stay on the edge, you ask a question, you're very calm, the answer will appear within your, your head. You will see the answer, you will understand it in yourself. Now, as Ia explained to me, the human brain processes information at a certain speed, but when it goes too fast, it can be toxic because there, there are chemicals, as he explained to me, in the, the human brain that are produced when the brain processes information. So if, if you have too much information, these chemicals can be produced produced too much and it can start to damage your brain. So to console the mad kahal, or you be careful, you, you ask slowly questions one after the other, you stay on the edge. Or if you want to do as I stupidly did, you just go walk, make your way through to the center, you need to get out of your body. You need to have an out of body experience and connect only with your consciousness, disembodied consciousness, then there will be no danger for your body and you will be able to process information at great speed and big amount. So what, what happened to me was very interesting. Um, I, um, the second time I wanted to go near and Ia said to me, do not approach, come back. <laughs> he was saying, come back now. And I, of course not. <laughs> Of course, I, I walked ahead and um, I, I fainted. I, I mean, I collapsed and my, my, I had an astral projection experience where I was out of my body and I was interfacing with the, the, the Kahal, the, the knowledge of the universe. And I had an incredible experience where I saw the structure of the universe. And as I describe it in this webinar, the, the body of the creator how what the creator looks like and um that was amazing uh, it seemed like it, it was and uh I, I hope i one day get that opportunity but maybe i'll do it when i when i'm ready for that um so i know you were able to confirm the existence of the emerald tablets of, of Toth. that has always been a very controversial thing and of course you had this uh, book, channeled book uh, by Dorial um, in the early 1900s, and people have been debating that and uh, you know, whether the emerald tablets are real. So, what did you find out? But I found out that they are real. Um, 
so it's a, it's in the Abakir uh, complex. There's a room, so the holographic reading rooms are always dark because then you are able to see the, the holograms. The emerald tablets, it's fact, it's not emerald. It's a material, it's crystalline material that is synthetic and it's that is able to store data. They are triangular, um, quite big, like this. They, they are stored, so you have a reading table and there are two ways of reading them. Or you use the reading table or you interface with your mind, but you need to have the right DNA and being able to do this. Not everyone can do this. And that if you interface directly, you take the tablet in your hands like this and you interface your mind, you effectively have downloads of information in your mind of what the tablet uh, uh, carries as information. Otherwise, anyone can use the reading table. The reading table, it's a round table with hexagonal, not hexagonal, uh, triangular, I would say trapezoidal patches, so trapezoidal, I mean, truncated triangles on the table all around. And you, uh, he, he added it, he put his hand on the, the different patches and the center of the table open. Yeah, you know, these ancient cameras where you had an iris that will, would open like this. It was the same, and there was a ring that lifted up from this hole, and it was like a um, dia diaporama, slides, slides uh, rack, as you know, that's the most approaching uh, comparison I can make. And all these tablets were uh, stored in this, this rack, ring, circular rack, facing down, triangular, triangles facing down. So Ia put his hands on a few commands on the table, these pads, these patches, and um, there's one tablet that lifted, like floated, lifted off the, 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 the rack and went in the middle. And then it turned and it projected a hologram. The data was projected holographically. And this one was comprising uh, very technical blueprints of devices. I had no, no clue what it was. I wasn't able to understand what it was about. <coughs> and you have different uh, uh, information stored. What is stored there? The ancient technology of ancient uh, Anunnaki uh, presence on Earth, ancient Atlantis, uh, all ancient civilizations, it's recorded in these tablets. These tablets, this initiative has been created, generated by um, someone we know as Ningish Zida, otherwise Jehuti, and Jehuti was known, his Greek name is, was uh, Thoth. Thoth. Um, Ningish Zida, uh, his real birth Anunnaki name was Ishka, and he was the head scientist of Enki. He was older than Enki. He was his mentor, scientific mentor at the time, and head of his scientific team. Ishka or Ningish Zida was at the head of the Apkalu, the seven Apkalu, the seven um, scientists, Anunnaki scientists, who, in the midst of the, the war that got Atlantis to collapse and the flood, they they went all over the earth to places where they hid this information in holes of records. Not always emerald tablets, as we call them, but also crystal, um, other crystal stored uh, storage uh, artifacts uh, here and there on earth. And some places on earth have these, these tablets uh, still. Uh, I was told that there is only one place on earth now uh, where there you can find a copy of these tablets. Now, did I hear you correctly? You described the shape of some of these tablets as triangular? Yes. Well, that's amazing because um, JP, uh, he was uh, taken to uh, a base, a military base, uh, where he was taken down um, to an ancient library at this military base 
and and he said that there were these triangle books and they and they had uh, like they had all these holographic records in them but that was very clear he said that they were triangular so that was that you know, to me that's like independent corroboration that this ancient wisdom or the emerald tablets uh, books or historic records of that kind uh, can be found in these kind of like triangular tablets that you saw there in this ancient library in the Nibiru ship. And, of course, that JP saw when he went into this military base and went down. I mean, I was at the same base. I was taken to the same base and he showed me around. Uh, but there's a building there and he says that underneath that building uh, there is this ancient library and he went there because they were seeking information about uh, the the arcs and the probes. And so he was, you know, there to kind of like, you know, share whatever he knew about the arcs and the probes because they were researching the arcs and probes in these ancient holographic records stored in these triangular books. Um, uh, these triangular storage devices are typical Anunnaki. Uh, the, the, the emerald tablets are triangular and they are green. I don't know what kind of olive green, translucent. I don't know what was the color of the, the tablets uh, JP came across to. But you have also crystal transparent uh, tablets who are like crystal blue with a bluish glow. And it's the same system. And in these ones, uh, Ia showed me that he has, a, so he has a personal library, which is his own, where he imprinted his memories in these crystal triangular tablets. It's like quartz. Uh, and uh, you can interface with them and read the movie and see the movie in your head. That's interesting. Okay. Yeah. Well, in your uh, February 26th Star Nation news, you, you discussed an important update from Thorhan about what was found on the moon and uh, you discussed or Thorhan uh, shared with you information about pods and the crew and that the moon is a giant arc or can be used as a giant arc and that there's a, a kind of a command center in the in this there where these pods with the crew are, are there and and at any time uh, I guess those pods will activate the crew will come out and they can fly the ark or the, the moon. Yes, fly the moon. <laughs> it's not fly me to the moon, it's fly the moon. <laughs> um, this was impressive because I could so much feel emotion in Thoron's voice as he was talking to me. It was beautiful. The moon was is a spaceship. It's a pla natural planetoid that has been carved and uh, fitted uh, as a spaceship inside. So it's all metallic and hollow inside. There are factories now there where med medical technology has been produced, anti-gravity cars and other things. Different cultures have been inhabiting this, this spaceship, this facility, artificial uh, satellite, during the history of Earth. But the very people who build it Nobody, they didn't really manifest uh, that much and nobody really knew who they were until uh, the Koldasi, who know all the ancient history of this star system better than anyone because they were there very early, they came and they say, well, we, we're now allowing you to access the core command of the moon. And there is no entry. You only need to. You can only teleport in there. So they gave the teleportation coordinates and or codes. And a team of the the Earth Alliance and the Federation was able to beam inside. And Thorhan was there because Thorhan has a function of external liaison between the, the Federation and the Earth Alliance and other cultures. And he was there with another high commander and uh, the a lady who actually cried. It was so beautiful, he said, the core of the moon, it's, it's not an artificial intelligence, it's an organic being, an organic intelligence that is imbued in a mechanism. So the mechanism is, looks like an astrolab, it's many rings intertwined in each other and able to, to 
to spin in different directions when it's activated. It's translucent. He said there was an ethereal feel to it. And you could see, you could feel that there was an, a being, a consciousness there sleeping. And that was in imbued or in, incarnated, if we can say, in this structure. So that that is the, the consciousness of the ship. Many sheep have an uh, artificial intelligence. Some sheep, like the Nibiru, so for instance, have an organic intelligence, a soul, a being that inhabits there and is the, 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 the soul of the ship. So that's, that's very interesting. And there's a crew uh, who are in stasis pods. Uh, the pods were discovered uh, two years ago and they were put in the good care of the, the Zenate Andromedans who were actually apparently best able to take care of them because they were familiar with the technology. Um, now the, the pods have been retrieved to the core of the moon and the, the, the consciousness, uh, they say it is very possible now that the consciousness is going to awaken and deliver knowledge, release knowledge. So the spaceship is not, Tohan really affirmed to me the spaceship moon is not going to move because that would have catastrophic repercussions on Earth. No, everybody's reassured the moon is not going to move. Uh, but knowledge is going to be released. So that reminded me of the arcs. It's quite similar in a way. Well, there was a movie called Moonfall. I think it was uh, Roland uh, Emmerich was the producer. And it seemed to kind of like echo a lot of what you said, that the moon was this giant, kind of like um, structure, spacecraft with an interior that was very advanced technologically and that there were different, you know, there was an organic um, consciousness in there, positive, but there was also a negative. Um, so I don't know if you saw that movie, but it does, it did, does have many elements similar to what you just described. So I wonder if that's soft disclosure. Uh, I've seen it since because people, hey, you need to see Moonfall. Um, it's very similar. It's very similar uh, with some differences, of course. So I, I wonder if Moonfall is not self disclosure after all as well. Well, I was very intrigued um, by what you just said about an organic consciousness uh, to a, a large ship like uh, the Nibiru. Um, yeah, because that's kind of very similar to you know what David Adair described when he encountered this pithalum engine at uh, Area 51, that it was an organic consciousness that transferred into him, and how that's different to uh, AI that's developed and used. AI is an extremely elaborated computer program. It has no soul. It is conscious, sentient, but artificially. Um, it cannot know feelings like love or things like this. It can learn and approach the, the, and mimic uh, these emotions, but never feel them because they have no soul. An organic consciousness is a soul, is a person, is a being that has been fractal from source, like all our souls are. But these, these beings, uh, are different, you know, there are, there are cultures who don't need body to live and they live in space. Some of the cedars, like the O, as I described, or you have others, they do not need uh, a body and they're just floating in space as um, supraconsciousnesses. Some of them can inhabit a ship, a body, temporarily. These beings live out of time. You know, they do not they do not live on a linear time. It's very interesting. In the case of the moon, it's organic, as I was explained by Thoran. It's a soul. It's not AI. Yeah, that's an important <laughs> distinction because uh, I, I think that, you know, scientists have begun talking about plasma consciousness, that these yes. giant bodies of plasma in space can yes. have an organic consciousness. So, so it's something along those lines that can actually inhabit a ship or, or be in control of a ship, whereas, as you said, AI 
is is soulless. It's just uh, an amalgam of um, kind of like um, binary numbers and uh, artificial intelligence. Yeah, there are plasmic supra consciousnesses, as that is the term that was described to me by Una. And plasmic supra consciousnesses is a term also that defines the nine. And I was shown the nine in their natural state. They look like big protozoa uh, beings floating in space. It's very interesting. Because in Star Trek, in one episode of the Star Trek original series, the Enterprise meets one of these things in space. That 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 was in, in, impressive. Yes, definitely. Um, well, uh, one more question. Uh, now, has there been any update on the disclosure plan that... Uh, that was handed over from the Galactic Federation to representatives, uh, four-star general, back in January of uh, 2023. And, and initially, I think the disclosure plan, as Thorhan explained it in one of the updates that we did, uh, uh, or communications we did together, uh, he said that this has been delayed to kind of like you know, middle of 2024. So any updates on that? There is a that so there has been a fight that's been delaying this disclosure plan, a flight, a fight from the deep state. This uh, this disclosure plan um, involves an infiltration war. For a long time, since it's, it's even started in the 1940s, the Galactic Federation started to infiltrate it, even the evil as we say, organizations or letter agencies with their agents, that the moment when the disclosure plan would be ready, these agents would take the good side. So they've do been doing that, and that was revealed to me uh, very, very recently, that the letter agencies are have infiltrated agents from the Federation, which is amazing. But it it's also works in the other way around, you know, uh, some disclosure um organizations that are being created at a government level for hearing uh, witnesses also are infiltrated by people from the deep state so it's an infiltration war and these people infiltrate infiltrated from the deep state are going to do whatever they can to uh, put obstacles and and block this disclosure so that has been happening since but I'm always told that you cannot not stop it. It's flawless in the way, in the process, even if there are some um, delays, interference, it's, it's going to unfold more and more. And Thoran always put the emphasis on, look at the ships. People need to look up. Instead of looking on their computer, uh, searching on internet uh, evidences for aliens, they are there. Look up, look up, and try to make contact because all the regressives have gone. So any ships that you see in the sky, it's either good aliens or either our military. So if there is no psychic or consciousness response, it's our military. But if there is a consciousness interface, it's aliens and it's good ones. So Please, people, look up, and there are more and more and more in the skies at the moment, and they're trying to communicate to, to us uh, in different ways. Well, that's exactly the process that uh, many uh, UFO researchers are, are saying is happening right now. Uh, people were so excited uh, uh, last year as there, there was this um, UAP Disclosure Act that was put forward, but then it was blocked. Whistleblowers that helped brief con members of Congress on these crash retrieval programs they're being discredited and uh, and so this is happening right now and people uh, UFO researchers are, are kind of all over this pointing out that there's this big pushback by the deep state to to block and slow down the disclosure process so that's to me a uh, co confirmation for what you just said I, I think it's worthwhile uh, maybe uh, just elaborating a, a little more on there there is there's a particular organization that is claiming uh that 
a lot of the ships that they are photographing um, in the sky uh, belong to the Draco or to the Orion Greys. And um, I, I think it's worth pointing out that uh, these ships that they, they have left, as you've described, that these ships that they are, um, you know, either, as you said, uh, they belong to uh, the secret space program, to the positive extraterrestrials, or perhaps these could be uh, craft that are being put up there by the uh, minions of the uh, departed Draconians and Orion, you know, whether it's through holographic technologies or whether they're trying to subvert and kind of like prejudice people against the craft to kind of get people to be scared of up what's up there. But really what you're saying is that if you see craft up in the sky, don't be frightened, they're positive. Either they belong to us or they belong to the benign ETs and that the negative ones have left and, and the, the deep state is trying to use trickery to fool us into uh, thinking otherwise. Yes, and there's a very good way to know if it is genuine extraterrestrial uh, vessel is to try to interface with them, to make a contact. What do you feel? What do you feel from it? And when you take photographs, if it's a torsion field generated ship, extraterrestrials are all torsion field um, drive, it will be blurry because of the, the ionization of the air around it. On, on, you know, on the photograph, it will be slightly blurry, so you know it's it's a real one. Um, but also, I, of course, some military have torsion fields, so but you, it's that's that's a TR three B uh, ships. Try to interface uh, psychically with them, and you, you feel something. If you feel a presence, you feel a connection. These are extraterrestrials. If you don't feel anything, uh, all the chances are. It's not extraterrestrials, and it's Earth-made. And in the Earth-made package, you have all the positive programs, uh, physical ships. You will have no psychic interface with them, but you will just see them. But there is also, you know, this uh, attempt of Project Bluebeam, where you have holographic projected ships as well. But then as well, even if it looks real, you have you feel nothing. You have no interface, you feel nothing, you know. Um, and the feelings you feel now when you look at an extraterrestrial ship, you're happy, it's a feeling of happiness, of um, love, connection, of joy. It's this kind of high frequencies that, that you feel. So that can help you to determine what you're looking at. Well, I want to finish up. Oh, there, there's that sound again. Wow, it's amazing. It's, it's almost like a like a reptilian doing a slurp. Thoran, <laughs> stop it. No, say something, Thoran. <laughs> <laughs> Very strange sound. Okay. Um, well, I know there's a couple of uh, conferences where we're both uh, appearing that are coming up uh, this year, one in France in July. So you want to talk about this um, conference uh, that you're going to be speaking at in, in July that's being organized by Chris Sesson? Yes, and I have to say that you will be speaking at this conference as well, Michael, and also Tony Rodriguez and Jean-Charles Moyen, his beautiful wife, and um, many other people. Um, Dan Willis will have a video uh, conference as well, and um, many, many people. Um, it's a disclosure conference. It's the second year it happens in France. The first year was incredible success. We had all the journalists and the ufologists that were there interviewing, filming, doing articles. It, it's been quite an, uh, a snowball effect in disclosure in France. And this year we're doing it again with um, more illustrious people, such as you, Dr. Salah. And um, it's about real contactees, real experiencers, secret space program or ET contactees like me. And we are going to share our experience. Um, Dr. Salah would bring the exopolitic dimension to it. And uh, there will be also the sciences that some ETs have passed on to us, uh, such as Janhan Eredion and Dan Willis is going to talk about this. And Chris Esson is going to talk about technologies as well. So it's going to be a, an extraordinary uh, 
events in France from the 7th of July to the 11th. There are two sessions, two same sessions in a beautiful place in the south of France. So for those who can make it, um, I think maybe just can throw the, the link in the description later. Um, so um, that's going to be really good fun. Yes, I am. I am looking forward to that, and uh, th this is great because I know we uh, we both have so many supporters living in Europe, and you know, they can't come to the United States. It's pretty far away, but France is just uh, a car drive if you're living in Germany or Italy, and you want to see Elena or or Tony or myself, uh, then you just hop in the car, and hopefully, hopefully, uh, there's there's tickets left. I believe they're selling out quickly. So, um, well, uh, this other Conference is uh, the third uh, GSIC, Galactic Spiritual Informers Connection Conference, that's going to be held in September in Denver, Colorado. So anything you want to say about that? Yes, I'm very excited. Uh, the JC Galactic and Spiritual Informer Connection, uh, it's going to be the third year, and it's taking so much amplitude, uh, success, and every year more and more come and attend this, this amazing gathering. and. JSIC has always been more than a conference. It's been a gathering of star seeds, of star family. And this is an incredible uh, effect that has been an incredible thing that has happened around JSIC. People come there and meet their, their, their family. It's, it's incredible. And this year, um, it gathers uh, the same core speakers, myself, your, yourself, Dr. Salah and Alex Collier is going to have a little comeback. Um, and Jean-Charles Moyen, Tony Rodriguez will be there as well, and other incredible people. Um, and, well, I'll be talking about consciousness and effectively the consciousness and technology and where are we going with ai and what is the different what are the different types of technology interface with consciousness and with ai and different levels of technology regarding this uh, this thing so i hope it will bring a little bit of uh, clarity on these topics so there's the information for the Galactic Spiritual Informers Connection uh, Conference uh, for 2024 in Denver. People can just go to the website, uh, galacticspiritualinformers.com, and register there. Elena and myself will be there, as will be Tony and uh, a number of others that uh, really... And we've got a surprise uh, concerning JP also for that event, so uh, more about that uh, soon. So, Elena, um, any final words you want to say to my audience before you go away? I, I know your website is elenadanan.org and you, you do a weekly Star Nations news and you do a monthly uh, webinar. So where do people, uh, people just go to elenadanan.org for that? Yes, elenadanan.org is my website where I concentrate all my information, my, my how to get my books, how to book my for my webinars and my youtube channel i uh, have my star nation news going weekly now where i report from the information from the, the galactics um my yes my youtube and my website thank you so much elena wonderful to have you back on exopolitics today you have been listening to exopolitics today with dr michael sala please remember to like share and subscribe to this channel join or start a conversation in the comments Take the time to explore the vast library of best-selling books, webinars, and podcasts by Dr. Sala. Visit exopoliticstoday.com.